Hey there friends, Dave Politis, can Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. And this is a missing person segment. And we have missing people from Oregon, Oklahoma, and British Columbia today. So, hang in there with me. It's going to be worth your while. There's some weird stuff going on out in this world. Today was a rough day for me. You know, just like everybody, you have good days, and then... I don't know if you call it a bad day, but I'm an acquaintance. I don't know the person really well, but I know him well enough. And I didn't know him quite as well. But I heard today that he didn't tell anybody, didn't tell me, that he had also lost a son. And he had watched the UFO Connection movie, and he saw at the end of the DVD where I have a tribute to Ben. And I think it, I think it touched him. He reached out to me and said he had also lost a son. And it affected me a lot. Because immediately I could start to feel his pain. And uh, I felt bad. I felt bad for me, but I also felt bad for him because I knew the pain that he was feeling. But I don't want to make that the center of this, but I do want to sometimes explain to you while maybe I'm not as fired up as I should be. And, uh, but we've got some interesting stuff to discuss, so away we go. Hey Dave, I've been following you and your research for roughly two years now. I'd like to send my deepest condolences for the loss of Ben. I'm a mother of five, and I cannot imagine your loss. I do hang on every word you say about prevention, so I, may, I would like to, you to know that his loss is not in vain. I know you have saved many lives. I hope so. I've heard you read quite a few emails that have to do with connecting with Ben. I'm a Christian and I know the Bible warns against necroma necromancy. However, I do believe that the Lord uses dreams. So there are many examples of him using dreams in the Bible. Um, if you've watched a lot of my videos about missing people, dreams have definitely found many people who have been deceased. It's far more than one or two. It's, it's strangely odd. I've had an experience that I'd like to share with you. It is in regards to my late uncle. When he was on his deathbed, he told my husband and I that he didn't know whether he was going to heaven or hell. My mind went blank, and the only answer that I could come up with for him was to tell him, you know Jesus. After he passed, though, I was very troubled by his last words to me. I would be, too. About six months after his passing, I had a very vivid dream where I saw him. But it was the young version of him that I remember about 20 years ago. Now, here's something odd about that. I talked to many people. And they say that when people pass and they, they're set up wherever they go, they're in that, they're kind of frozen in time at that younger version of them, that healthy, spry person that they always wish they could just stay. So that was, that was interesting that she said that. He was very happy and I told him that he looked amazing. He assured me that he was doing great and that I didn't need to worry about him. I then noticed that his hands looked very old. I commented on it and his response was, I have always had old hands. Then he laughed his jolly old laugh and that's about all I remember. Key points. I woke up and could not stop thinking about that dream. I didn't know what it meant or what to make of it. I was on the phone later and my dad with my dad and I told him the details of my dream. He also found it interesting but didn't know what to do with it either. 
Later that day, however, my dad called my aunt and happened to relay my dream to her. When he was finished, my aunt was silent. My dad checked to make sure she was still on the line. My aunt told him her dream was real. Her dream validates that he is doing well. My aunt, my aunt then explained to my dad that over the course of their marriage, they had a running joke that my uncle's hands always looked much older than the rest of him. Even in his youth, he always had old hands. There's no way I could have known their inside joke about my uncle's hands. I did not spend enough time around them to even accidentally overhear it. My mind was blown. I really felt like it was a sign from God that my uncle truly is in a good place. I've had a few other dreams similar in nature, but I still struggle with what it makes of them. Maybe you and your listeners have some ideas on what these kind of dreams could mean. If you had any, put it under the comments of this video, write a comment about it. Anyway, Dave, I just want to share the experience with you as I felt like you would understand it. Maybe not have answers, but at least understand how I feel about it. Thank you so much for your work and all that you do. You have touched many more lives than I think you could ever imagine. Please don't let the haters ever get you down because they are few in comparison to your tribe. The tribe will always have your back. Well, thank you for that. I told a story a couple of videos ago where I was with somebody and this person, uh, I, don't, I don't know if they call themselves a psychic or a visionary or sensitive or whatever, but we were talking about Ben just in a completely passing comment, we're walking somewhere and she just blurted out, hey Dave, Ben says uh, your hair looks good. You have good hair. Holy shoes. Almighty. Ben always used to kid me about my hair. He said, Dad, you got great hair. I wish I had your hair. And for a young, young man, he kind of had a receding hairline and he goes, yeah, I'm, I'm losing my hair. And you always got the best hair. Why do you have that hair? This person said that. There's no way I've, I haven't even said it to anybody. It blew me away. I got tears. Next letter. Hello, I live in Sacramento, California. I wanted to send you some photos I've taken over the last few years. Summer was a hot one, I think it was 116. That's hot. I think in September we took off to cool down to Kybers on the Silver Fork Road, down 50 towards Lake Tahoe. We saw a footprint on the side of the Silver Fork Road and at one of the campsites by the river was some weird looking stick structure in the fire pit with an X beside it. I told my daughter and her two friends, don't touch it. We're just looking for a kickback spot to hang out and cool off for a bit because it was neat. We had a beer and I took off my shoes and I stepped into the water. It's a very cool spot and the water wasn't very deep. By looking at the strange sticks, I thought it was from Sasquatch because I believed they were here because I've seen the structures here before a few years back when we were cutting a Christmas tree. At this time, I've seen a fort made on the side of the hill on the other side of the river overlooking a single side by the water. Other stick structures I've encountered are in Mount Shasta and a lake not far from my house named Sugar Pine Reservoir by Forest Hill. And near Cortez, Colorado by the Dolores River, a big X made out of aspens. These stick structures are always by the road or pass for people to see. I believe they are like I believe they like to watch people because while kayaking at Sugar Pine Reservoir. I went across the lake right across the boat dock and in a shady spot with broken sticks and branches pulled down to create shade for the smaller trees. You could see the boat dock real good while being concealed behind the trees and bushes. The X means something, I believe. My daughter and I went for a drive a few years back at French Meadows Reservoir for the day. and I felt the ground rumble and told my daughter, be quiet. Did you feel... She's like, no. Then a whoop, whoop, whoop comes across the dirt road behind the trees, about 50 or feet or so from us. 
I'm going to send you a photo I've taken of a print we found. I'm not looking for anything when we go out. I just keep my eyes open and see the strange things out of the ordinary. My shoe next to the footprint is a size 13. Thought you might find it interesting coming from a person that doesn't go far from the car or cross things out. I've been enlightened by all the information from your videos. Like, don't separate from the group, etc. We practice when we go Christmas tree hunting. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge. I gotta admit, pretty strange print. And here's why. First of all, there's a size 13 foot or shoe. Here's the footprint. And you can definitely see toes. And you can definitely see the indentation. And the interesting part to me is that you can see how pushed in the dirt is. Now, I don't know how much she could push the dirt in or he could, but I doubt it was anything at all. But it exemplifies how heavy these things are. And to put an indentation with a toe is pretty phenomenal. Thank you for that photo, it was excellent. Hey Dave, I know you like your letters brief. Yes. But I can promise a good grammar and punctuation. Sorry, buddy, but I have a lot to share. Okay, here we go. Firstly, I was there when you lost your son, Ben. It was gut-wrenching for me and the rest of the villagers, and even now brings a tear to my eye just mentioning it. Dave, thank you for sharing that experience with us. I know by your character that you had no choice but to share. But you did have a choice. You did choose to share. It's obvious that it was cathartic for you. And Dave, you welcomed us into your family by doing so. We love you, brother, and we will always carry that burden with you. You are not alone. The pride you have for that young man. It's a beautiful thing. I enjoy when you show it on your face. It was your spitting image. We, the village, will forever be there. Now, with that said, let's get down to business. I'm going to share a Bigfoot close encounter, although I've had two a UFO sighting, and I'll close with a few random but loosely related thoughts. I'm a 51-year-old Virginia resident. When I was a teen, one night, my best friend and I were creeping through the neighborhood very late at night, skateboarding and being typical malcontent teens. The neighborhood was a fairly new one built into a rural lush woodland on the outskirts of growing northern Virginia town. We took a break near the entrance to the neighborhood near the pool house in a parking lot under a light pole lighting the parking lot. All was quiet. It was at the dead of night. We were sitting up on a parking space curb catching our breath and talking. Something began to make noise in a large bush directly behind us. It was the most eerie, mournful, and menacing sound I've ever heard. Unlike anything I have ever heard, it started out kind of quiet and mournful and became more aggressive after we reacted to it in obvious fear. It was like a mix of guttural growling and what I would imagine would be the sound of a human baby being tortured. We were petrified. I've never been so scared in my life. After what seemed like forever standing there listening to this unseen menace in the bush, frozen in fear, we ran for our lives. <laughs> yeah. Although I have been raised as a hunter in Michigan, I was new to Virginia and unfamiliar with their wildlife. In an effort to rationalize the experience, I chalked it up to a bobcat or cougar, both of which I had never encountered before. The experience always haunted me. In case people have never heard, Google um, cougar sounds or mountain lion sounds, not growl or not roar sounds. Years later, after the advent of the internet, in an effort to satisfy my curiosity, I studied big cat calls and discovered the sound from that bush was no big cat. The experience remained an unsolved mystery until years later. I discovered the Sierra sounds. It makes my hair stand on end even now. When I hear Ron Moorhead's recordings, I knew that was what I heard that night, no doubt. And we have that right here in our online store. It's a CD. 
And we highlighted that in our movie, Missing 411 The Hunted. If you go to Amazon, it's there right now. You can watch it. And uh, Ron's hunting partners all heard something very, very odd in the bushes. And Ron recorded it. And contrary to what a bunch of haters say, I've seen the reports. He had that analyzed at a university and the sounds are outside of what a human could do. Good try. Now, as for my UFO sighting, I hope you and the villagers will appreciate this. Of course you will. It was December 10th, 1999, a Friday night. My wife and I had just moved into our new home and were having a housewarming party. Several of us smokers had stepped out back to have a smoke break. Don't do that. Kids, don't smoke. Again, this was a northern Virginia town, Fredericksburg, right on the Highway 95 and Route 1, two major thoroughfares just south of D.C., Andrews Air Force Base, and the CIA's Langley headquarters. Keep that in mind. As we stood there chatting and smoking, something in the night sky towards the north caught my eye. At first, it appeared to be a small constellation of stars. What caught my eye was the fact that it was moving. Whatever it was, it was moving from north to south, heading our way. It flew smoothly above the tree line in the night sky approaching our position. I did not take my eyes off of it, but at the same time, I had difficulty really focusing my eyes on it until it was close enough for me to really understand what I was looking at. Keep in mind that was observed by a half a dozen people, all of us quite startled and amazed. This is what I saw. I burned the image into my mind so I'd never forget it. It was a craft. I have some experience of observing aircraft from military paratrooper drops and also working near an airport. It appeared to be at approximately 800 to 1,000 feet, cruising at a typical airliner speed of maybe 180 miles an hour. Anyway, the reason it initially appeared to be a constellation was because I was seeing light from the city sprawl below reflecting off the bottom of the craft, with the light being particularly, particularly brightest at the sharp corners, appearing to be points of light. It seemed to be following the north, following the path of the highways below it, very busy, bustling city, North Virginia highways. It made no sound, zero. As it got closer, I realized why I had such a difficult time focusing. The outside edge of the craft had distorted lights rotating around the edge. Very much reminded me of the distorted light camouflage of the Predator in the old Predator movie. Just like one of your hunter stories in your documentary, it was very obvious to me that something in that craft was rotating with such mass and velocity that it was literally distorting light around the outer edge of the plane of its axis. I suspect it was using something like a circular particle collider for propulsion. Keep in mind it was huge, moving slowly through the air with no sound. Once it reached approximately the center of the city, it paused for a split second and then poof. It changed direction, heading off at about 45 degree angle to higher altitude at such speed that my eye could barely see it go. The best way to, for me to describe it is to compare it to the old Star Trek, the next generation scene where the Enterprise zips into warp drive, just like that, with, but with no flash of light. Here's the kickers. This wasn't a saucer, it wasn't exactly a triangle. I got a really good look at it. It was the same exact shape as a US B-2 bomber, but it was bigger, much bigger. It had to have been at least the size of a football field, very likely bigger, but the exact same shape and profile. If you look up a B2 image, all those little corners on the profile appeared to be points of light from the ground. It was an amazing sight. I've seen B2 bombers up close at air shows. This is what I saw. I'd heard for years that our government had B2s with alternative propulsion systems and as an aside, I found it very interesting that Dan Brown described the very same craft in uncanny detail in his, uh, in his novel, Angels and Demons. As for me, I know, not, I know that not all UFOs are otherworldly. I saw it with my own eyes, and I'm convinced this was a U.S.-developed craft. If so, with my two experiences shared, I have a few thoughts I'd like to share. I had the misfortune of experiencing botched spinal surgery that left me bedridden for many months in 2005 and 6. I decided to use this time to research and study many, many mysteries about my human existence that had haunted me back in life. I began with the assassination of John Kennedy. 
My journey from that point took me into Alice's Wonderland, one mind-bending revelation after another, covering the gamut of every so-called conspiracy theory after another, from current events all the way back to the origins of mankind. Our ancestors, the founding humans of our history, literally point to stories of the gods of what they call the Anunnaki, in stone to preserve for posterity. I suggest any critical thinking human to research it. Your research opens a can of worms that can lead to subjects. It's a logical progression. Our society is very obviously tightly controlled by an unaccountable elite. I suspect that they keep us ignorant for purposes of control and likely to hide the truth of our creator. I won't delve into all that except to comment upon one aspect of my rabbit hole research. Physics. Okay, this guy did write a lot, but it's not bad. Obviously, interdimensional travel, beings, craft, etc. would require an understanding of energy and matter manipulation that the common man is not privy to, but very obviously our government is. You've attested to this fact yourself. But the clues are out there. The elitists that manage our society may suppress truth and technology, but they can't hide it all. The villagers can be quite resourceful when we organize our thoughts and put many critical thinking minds to work together. When, talk, when talking about observable phenomena, currently as far as common man is concerned, we are limited by observable phenomena within a limited energy matter frequency range, from the limits of ultraviolet to infrared. Beyond that, we do not have the commonly known or accepted tech to measure or observe anything that may be operating at frequencies above or below these limits. However, we do have some understandings of physics that may be helpful with direct relation to our specific research. Everything from Bigfoot, mind control, to interdimensional teleportation and portals. Michael Faraday, the world famous physicist, discovered and invented what is known as the Faraday cage. In essence, a metal cage will block and interfere with electromagnetic fields. Thanks to modern technology, we have a product available to us that may be useful with regards to self-protection in regards to your research. It's called Faraday fabric or Faraday cloth. The cloth is primarily used for cell phone security to block RF radio frequencies, signals coming and going to and from electronic devices. It's the most famously used for phone pouches when reporters join the U.S. president aboard Air Force One. But most don't know this cloth fabric has other security uses, such as defeating lasers, defeating microwave-directed energy weapons, etc. It is likely available in bulk on eBay and Amazon and even already marketed as finished clothing or military, law enforcement, and even political pro protesters alike. This may seem laughable, but in essence, it's a modern take on the tinfoil hat. Yeah. Anyone wearing it incorporated into their clothing essentially would walk around in an RF bubble, protected from radio frequency around them. Potentially RF distortions of any kind, whether intentionally directed at the user or not. Imagine a hiking or hunting outfit made of such material may potentially be just as useful as a portable locator beacon. Just a thought, something to consider, something to share with the wonderful collective of critical thinkers you have assembled. My final thought for you, Dave. Buddy, friend, you are nosing around things that literally threaten the status quo of our elitist managers. Be careful, bro. We love you. Give Huck some sugar for me, and please give my regards to Angie. I'll give my regards. A well, little Huck is not going to get any sugar. <laughs> <laughs> she would go bonkers. <laughs> I do give her treats every now and then, though. But we have a, a couple of toys where you could put the treat into a position on the toy where she has to work at it for 10 or 15 minutes, and she flips it around. She goes back and forth. You can see her mind working. And lately, it's starting to bother me. That's how smart this dog is. She'll pick the toy up, and throw it in the air and watch it hit the ground, hoping that the treat comes out of the toy. Angie and I watch this and goes, wow, that is smart. Okay, next letter. Good evening, Dave, just a fellow villager from Chicagoland. Oh, that's, you people, if you live in and around Chicago, be careful. 
Unfortunately, I'm stuck here until I can move my family to Montana one day. Okay, let me begin with a strange story. I've been following your content for several years. I've watched your documentaries, YouTube content. Your content really puzzled me and it sent me down many rabbit holes. Your work has sent me to people like Isdal, Carpenter, Moorhead, Marzulli, and others. This is what has been going on with me. I've been obsessively watching and doing homework on Sasquatch. After all my research at home, I've come to the conclusion that these beings are probably Nephilim. The night I was convicted with my truth, I was awakened at 3 a.m. and witnessed a black hooded figure standing next to my bed. The dread and fear I experienced, I can't explain. Dave, all I could do was cry out to Jesus. Next thing, through mind speak, roared the loudest sound into my head. Next, I saw two angels appear and chase this thing off into thin air. I've been so shaken ever since it happened. I immediately, the next day, got some sage and a Bible and cleansed my house. Just wanted to share this strangeness with you. Uh, yeah, that's a little strange. There's definitely some weird stuff going on around us. I can't tell anyone about what happened because it sounds so bizarre and I don't want to be labeled as nuts. God bless you and your family. I'm sorry to hear about Ben, your friend, Chicagoland. I don't know if I could sleep in a room if I had woke up and saw that on my bed. Whew. Next one, hey brother. There's nothing you can do about the idiots put there that are stealing your work. One of the problems with our nation today is we have a whole generation of people that are watching other people's lives on the internet and they're not willing to live their own life. Aim into that. Your quality work is an easy target. I know you want to read the replies because we have a village and it seems that we have a collective that will figure out this mystery someday. I think we will. But I'm convinced that one of the tricks of the internet is don't read the replies. All you're doing is tormenting yourself. I don't know how you're going to solve the problem that you have right now, but if you can see becoming more and more frustrated with every video you produce, not worth it. I had a laugh the other day when you were talking about what your mother told you because my mother told me the same thing. If you can't see something good about somebody, just don't say anything. That's right. I get a lot of people, I get a lot of emails every day asking me about people. Hey Dave, what do you think of this researcher or what do you think of that person? I'm not being rude, but if I don't want to hear from me, I, I, I'm going to lean on what my mom told me. I just won't answer, just won't say anything. The only person that's being hurt by this situation is you and those idiots are probably sitting back laughing about how frustrated you are. The, rea the reality is that you can't do a thing about it. If I lived in Montana, I'd come do it for you, but I'm going to tell you, Dave, I live in Florida. It's easy for me to spend on other people's money and it may not be your answer, but I'm going to tell you anyways. You might hire somebody part-time to go to the comments and get rid of all the bad ones, keep the good ones, and then you read the good ones. Anyway, I thought I might just give you that thought to help your mental health. I hate to see you so distraught over the situation. God bless. I've had the same advice many times. And I would say, I read all the comments on the videos, unless I'm out of town. And if I get a bad comment, sometimes I'll just dump it before I finish it. Other times I'll read it. And rarely I will respond to it. I think your advice is 100% right because I found that the people that last the longest out there on the internet are the ones that don't read the garbage that's sent in. So I'm listening. Angie tells me the same thing all the time. Dave, don't read it. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> Hey Dave, I had some thoughts on a notion that people often express relating to alien beings have spoken to them telepathically and these entities can read your mind. To me, it doesn't seem very far-fetched. Just the way dogs have been engineered to sense or even smell things that we can't. So too might aliens have been equipped with incredible sensors, which we, to this point, seem to have a hard time imagining. I don't, I don't have a hard time imagining that at all. Here's a little analogy. Back in the 60s, me and a farm crew often had little transistor radios with us for listening entertainment. Those little two inch by four inch radios incredibly picked up invisible signals from a radio station 30 miles away 
and were able to read the exact signals sent at a speed of light and re reproduce those songs perfectly. It still amazes me how someone figured out how to do this. Imagine people from 500 years ago being told this could be possible. No doubt they would have a hard time believing it. <laughs> I've thought of the exact same thing. Imagine sounds coming out of a little box, which was the radio, and you put it in front of somebody 500 years ago, and you turned it on, they'd think you were a god. Well, what if alien forms have a mechanism built into their beings that allows them to read tiny thought vibrations or wave signals, even at a great di greater distance in other life forms like humans? Maybe our thoughts are like waves and radio stations beams out to pick up and translated by that device and interpreted by us to become understandable. Likewise, maybe aliens can read our thoughts as transmissions and they are capable of understanding them. We are the radio station and they have receivers built into their life form and they can tune into our frequency and hear what we're thinking. Exactly. Much like the saying, one picture paints a thousand words, perhaps aliens can visualize our thoughts in a flash which tells the complete story. Maybe that's why they are reported to have small mouths. They don't need to speak because they simply exchange thoughts and see the entire picture. Often I think how long it takes for us to explain something to someone using spoken language. Imagine how quickly we could convey something if we could project an entire vision into someone's mind in an instant and even read what they think of it. So far, our species doesn't seem to have that capability. Imagine communicating with another human by projecting thought only. It would be impossible to tell a lie because your mere thoughts would show to the truth. That would be, that'd be fun with kids and bosses. <laughs> Maybe they can even see our past if we direct our thoughts to our memories. Perhaps that is why often aviators describe their interactions with UFOs as if the UFOs are anticipating every move and just playing games with them. Maybe the aliens are turning into pilots' thought frequency and know immediately what the pilots are going to do. Little do the pilots know they are broadcasting. Also, what if beings in other dimensions can see at will everything we do all the time? It's a rather scary thought, but so is the entire missing 411 mystery. Maybe we're being monitored all the time and don't realize it. It seems that whatever the culprit is, it is intelligently picking and choosing their victims. It seems that if we can't figure out how and what is happening, it would be very difficult to mount a successful defense. Just on a quick, lighter note, my wife and I were in a pet store last week and a couple came in with a dog who looked exactly like Huck. No, not my little Huckster. Is it a great Pyrenees, I said. Wow, that looks just like Dave's dog. I told them about Huck and your program and suggested they should watch it someday. And oh yes, on another note, I tell a lot of friends and acquaintances about missing 411 vis videos, docs, presentations, and sometimes I'm totally dismayed by their seemingly indifferent attitudes about it. Sometimes they react like your investigations just make good bedtime stories. Not, not if you're the victim's family, it's no good bedtime story. I can't believe how disinterested some people can be towards such a serious phenomenon. Just like UFO non-believers, they can't be persuaded about the truth of it until it happens to them. As far as I'm concerned, your work is so important it should be treated like a national emergency. Everyone should be up in arms. I'm sure the relatives of these people certainly are, and if we give a damn about our fellow man, this phenomenon should not be taken lightly. I hope you never lose your fire, Dave, because what you're doing is crucial, compassionate, and just downright necessary. As always, Thanks for your dedication. Thanks for your note. That was good. Well thought out. Hey Dave, I'm a retired architect and an avid reader. I read maybe 50 books a year plus periodicals. Whew. That's one a week. That's humping. I'm also involved with design, art, and construction, but still make time to listen to your shows on Missing Persons and Bigfoot. Also bought your third movie. I find them all quite compelling. Thank you. In your last Bigfoot class, number 12, you mentioned 
how you appreciated historical references. I suddenly remembered an article I read when I was an adolescent that really made an impression on me. I already knew what he was going to say because I've heard of this article. Remember it said that, the, okay, it was an article in Boy's Life magazine. I was in the Boy Scouts at the time and somewhat out of context with their regular content. The article was about how some early Spanish explorers arriving in Mesoamerica had encountered large hairy men-like creatures. I remember it said they heard their vocalizations when first anchoring off the shores. They pursued these creatures into the interior, wishing to bring them back evidence for the king. They killed one and packed the body in salt to preserve it. But when they finally made it back to the coast, they discovered that the body had totally disintegrated. The article would have appeared in the mid-60s. I thought it may be worth looking into the original sources. Yeah, if anybody has an archive for that period of time for Boys Life magazine, I'd like to see that. That'd be excellent. So, those are letters for this week. Every video, somebody puts a comment up about why are you reading these letters? And I know there's a group out there that totally gets it. But the people that don't get it are the ones I'm worried about. And they'll say, fast forward to this time period and, and watch the missing cases. But this is all related, folks. What I've read to you is some really interesting detail on the missing phenomena that we need to contemplate and think about. And the people that are just wanting to know about missing people, it's almost as though they just want to be entertained. And that bothers me. I really have not tried to make this an entertainment show. You don't see fancy graphics. You don't see fancy displays. It's just one man telling you about these cases that we've researched and found. And in this instance, the cases I'm going to give you have never been heard before the time they happened 50, 60, 70 years ago. And they're missing people cases that are dumbfounding in their facts. So the first case. Never, never in all my research have I come across a case that matches this one. Friends, that's a lot of cases. Here's the facts. William Bros, Harry Lacus, and R.B. Walker, C.B. Walker, were all friends. And they lived in Medford, Oregon. They left Medford on October 17, 1911, to go elk hunting in Elk Creek, north of Medford, and about 20 miles southwest from Crater Lake National Park. Yes, that Crater Lake. They took provisions for about two weeks. They were very experienced hunters, well-armed, knew the area they were going to. Now, they took two weeks worth of food and provisions, and they were going to be back on November 1st. Again, they left October 17th. November 1st came and went, and families and friends weren't too distraught, weren't too concerned. And neither would I. Three guys together in the woods, not an issue. Definitely look out for each other. Definitely, if there was a problem, one or two would come back and get help. November 4th arrived, and still nobody had heard anything, and fear started to get alive in the family circles. Sir Harry Lacus's dad, O.C. Lacus, organized the search and rescue team 
to leave on November 6th, spend seven days in the mountains if needed, in that Elk Creek area. So, this is important. This is Crater Lake right here. This is Elk Creek. This is Medford down here. And this is the road you take from Medford to go up to Crater Lake. Been there many times. Elk Creek is not far from Crater Lake. This area has so much strangeness to it, I can't even begin to know where to start, but I, I will explain it to you in a bit. So the team spent seven days, they get up to Elk Creek, and there's way more snow in that valley than normal. First issue. And it was still snowing at times. After a week, the team comes back, we supplies, gets more fresh guys, goes back up there. And Mr. Lacus, totally committed to finding his son and his friends. Two weeks of searching and going back the following year when there was no snow and going back the following year again when there was no snow. This is the part that is absolutely stunning. None of the three men were ever found. That's never happened in my world. Most of the time, uh, three guys would not stay together and hunt. That's number one. So if they didn't stay together and they split up, what would be the chances that all three would go missing and never found? ridiculously small and the idea they're never found that's ridiculous on its front so when I said that this is an important case this is a really important case why is it important well number one Elk Creek is just 20 miles southwest of Crater Lake it's in that cluster zone of missing people in and around Crater Lake so what I did for you is I went out and dug around. And I dug around that crater lake diameter area around the lake. Now, first of all, Crater Lake was formed when Mount Mazama exploded and left this giant crater. And left and now has this impeccably clean water in Crater Lake. Native Americans, they didn't like that area. They were afraid of it. They first thought that there was a monster inside the lake, and then there was so much bad juju that went on in and around the lake, they stayed away. But let's look at what kind of activity they've had around Crater Lake. So just a few miles north of Crater Lake, is Diamond Lake. So this happened July 26, 2016 at 10.30 at, uh, p.m. This is a, a narrative that was about a UFO seen over Diamond Lake. It said the night of Tuesday, July 26, 2016, I was up late watching a movie. Can't state where I live, as I also work there, and any mention of the organization I work for by name gives them the right to own this report. But I can say I am a fire lookout. So they work for the U.S. Forest Service. At about 22.30, that's 10.30, I had to go to the bathroom, walked out onto the catwalk, my fire lookout noted a white light with red and green flashing lights to the north, just off the horizon. I assumed it to be an airplane but took note of it because it was not on the general metropolitan or metropolitan flight paths that cross the area, and it apparently is significantly lower than standard planes. The lights were also brighter and larger than far-off commercial airliners. I went back into the lookout, finished my movie, and about 
11 o'clock, I went out to the cat catwalk to brush my teeth and noted the object was still there and appeared to have not moved at all. This surprised me, as neither airplanes nor satellites stay in the same place for a long period of time. After cleaning my teeth, I returned inside and looked at it through binoculars briefly, then pulled out my spotting scope and fixed on the object at 60x. I cannot accurately gauge the object's distance, but judging at the increase in size of the object in the spotting scope, I estimated it to be 30 to 50 miles away with an exact azimuth of 22.2 degrees from my position as measured with an Osborne Firefighter 1934 model. The object was like a kite in shape, but narrower side to side and longer top to bottom. It had a white-orange light in the center, similar in color to an old halogen headlight, with a red light below and right of the white, orange one, and a green light above. The object itself was dark, and I can only estimate it as its shape due to the visible light emitted on the white-orange light. The white orange light remained constant, but the green and red lights alternated strobing. As this is the standard, standard pattern for commercial aircraft, I then wondered if it was a helicopter and my mind was simply making the shape of the visible light I could see. With 60x magnification on the scope, however, the object did not move out of the frame from 11 to midnight. That would require an object to remain absolutely still, uncharacteristic of helicopters. At midnight is when I observed its only visible change. At midnight exactly, another object entered the sky while I was looking through the scope, so I did not see it immediately when it was uh, assumedly rose above the location. It was as below previously listed objects slightly to the right. I looked at this one through the spotting scope. The shape appeared to be two isosceles triangles facing down, connected together at the Midwest point. The color was red at the top, orange in the center, and yellow at the bottom, with these three colors assuming to be lit up in a repeated wave pattern from top to bottom. One triangle was dark while the other was light. The rhythm of the light shows that the two triangles was extremely fast. The right, right triangle appeared in full to perfection, as I could see all three corners. However, when the left triangle lit up its top center corner, it was cut off at the angle. This leads me to believe the right triangle was closer than the left. What does this remind you of? Remember those flashing lights I tell you about that I've seen occasionally and others of you have written in and said, they flash different colors and they're real fast and they stay in one position. I remained awake until 1.30 when I had to fall asleep as I had to work the next day. I'm used to waking up at 6 o'clock, so I was extremely tired. The kite-shaped object was still in the sky and still located in its second position listed in this report. I awoke after daybreak at 7.30 and the object was not visible. Fascinating report. And remember, I've told you before about fire lookouts in Washington on a Native American reservation seeing things in the sky. Yes, fire spotters are very keenly aware of what's going on in the sky around them. Very. Next report, again from Diamond Lake, same area. January 30th, 2014. Shape, light, duration, three minutes. Characteristics. There was an aura or haze around the object, big red orb flying over Diamond Lake. I was outside the cabin smoking a cigarette when I looked up and saw a big red object in the sky going from south to north direction, about the speed of a small airplane. At first I thought it was a flare or a fireball, but it kept going out at a constant speed and realized it was neither. I yelled for my wife to come out and see it, and she came out to look. She ran back in to get a camera to capture it. By that time, she came back out and it disappeared at tree line. Now, just southwest of Crater Lake is a city called Prospect. This is where this next sighting came from, from the National UFO Reporting Center, Prospect, Oregon. My daughter and I saw a ball of light looking east from Prospect. We called out to other members of the family so they could see it. 
It was very bright white and appeared to be twinkling. It moved up through the clouds in the south very slowly. We took lots of pictures and got three video clips. The kids went inside after about 15 minutes and my husband and I were still outside watching. My husband handed me the binoculars to look at. When we looked back up, it was gone. The event lasted 20 minutes. Not sure if it was the same thing or just an anomaly. Interesting. Next one. This is a Bigfoot report. Jackson County, Oregon, just west of Crater Lake National Park near Union Creek. Well, son of a gun. Elk Creek was also just west of Crater Lake. Observed. I was deer hunting on the east slope of a very steep hillside and saw movement 70 yards down and away from me. This was in October 1999. Another hunter. I started to bring my rifle up but realized it was too dark and tall to be a deer. I saw this thing walk through the trees and even though it was very dry and crunchy in the woods, it made no sound. Remember what I've told you before. It's almost like these things can walk above the ground. Nothing can walk on the ground and not make sounds if it's crunchy. I saw it walk very briskly for about 40 yards, then it turned down slope and out of sight. The following day in an area a few miles away, we found unusually large dung piles full of berry remains. And my hunting partner and I thought that they were from a very big bear. And even then I thought it would be too difficult for a bear to pass such a large diameter stool. This happened on the second day of deer hunting season, about 5.30 to 6 p.m., 4,500 foot elevation. So, it's kind of a close-up on one area where three people disappeared. In that area, a lot of UFOs and a lot of Bigfoot reports. Is it all related? Well, if you've been taking my Bigfoot class, you should have been establishing some thoughts on that idea. So the next case, from Oklahoma, Bob Williams, 70 years old, went missing July 23rd, 1953. In a, he was a farmer in a city called Garvin. So this is a map this is the Oklahoma-Texas border and the Red River. This is Garvin, Oklahoma. River flows up near Garvin. There's also the Little River that flows right near where this farmer lived. Get an idea, far south, east Oklahoma. This is Idabel, and this is Broken Bow to give you some idea about where it exactly happened. So Bob had lived on his farm that was owned by him and his brother for his entire life. Imagine living on a piece of property your whole life. I can almost guarantee I could walk around the property with my eyes closed and know where I was. Well, as he got older, he started to lose his eyesight. He wasn't totally blind, but he had lost a lot of his eyesight. And that area of Oklahoma is considered some of the roughest in the state. Well, on July 23rd, in the late afternoon, Bob asked his brother to borrow a bar of soap because he was going to go down to their spring and wash a few shirts. His brother gave him the bar, and Bob took off walking towards the spring, right direction and everything. Several hours passed, and Walter, his brother, got nervous because he hadn't seen Bob. So he walked down to the spring, and on the way to the spring, laying on the path there, is the bar of soap. He thought, well, that's very odd. And he kept looking, and he wasn't finding anything. Well, he searched for several hours. Then he called the McMurton County Sheriff's in Oklahoma. And they came out and they searched that area around the spring. And then the sheriff ordered up the National Guard, 
several teams of Boy Scouts, and 30 men from the community. And they searched the Little River, the Big River, and they found Bob's tracks about two miles from where that spring was, which everyone thought was suspicious because there was no way Bob would have walked out that far because he would have known where he was at. Well, the McMurton Sheriff brought in a dog team, searched for several days, brought in many people on horseback, and the National Guard searched for eight days. They never found anything. Canines never picked up a scent. And the search was terminated August 5th with nothing found. Walter, the brother, was devastated. Now, Bob was 70 years old. Again, a little rough on the eyesight. But the thought that he would have gotten lost on his own farm didn't make sense to anybody. And the idea that they bring canines to the scene and they're unable to track Bob makes no sense. That area of uh, southeast Oklahoma and northeast Texas doesn't have a lot of missing people. The area of central and if you go in central Oklahoma and you go as far east as you can, now that area and that same adjacent area in Arkansas, woo, lots of strange stuff there. So. Now the next one touched my heart hard really hard and you'll see why case happened in british columbia the boy's name was john eisenman six years old went missing november 6 1966 at 4 p.m oh 4 p.m dave you always talk about 4 p.m yeah why number one time that people go missing now in bob williams case it was probably about 4 p.m they said late afternoon but they didn't say so John Eisenman, he and his family were at a place called Centennial Park in Burnaby Mountain, British Columbia. Burnaby Mountain, hold your taters. So here's Vancouver, British Columbia. Here's Burnaby Mountain. This is the Capilano Suspension Bridge Park up in this area. This is Eagle Mountain. Folks, all of this area, all the way up in here, is one massive missing person group. It's huge. That's why when we wrote the Canadian book, there is a map just on British Columbia in that book because the number of people is hard to understand. Now, this is a brand new case that we just found, and you're seeing it for the first time. Now, it's probably not going to make any sense to a number of people that really don't know our work, but it's going to make sense to you. So mom and dad are up there picnicking. At about 4 o'clock, John says, I'm going to go on an adventure. And the family loses sight of him. Well, they search for an hour. They can't find him, and they call the RCMP. As the RCMP is arriving at about 5 o'clock, the fog is moving in. And it's getting dark quick. Something fascinating is the German translation for Eisenman. Yeah, it's a German name. Eisenman means Iron Man. That's weird. So the RCMP is on site, fog's moving in, it's getting cold. They close the park, they bring in canines, and they bring in 50 searchers. They send the canine handler home when they're not having luck, and the canine handler says, let, let everything in this area calm down. Scent-wise, I'll come back at 3 o'clock, and I'll bring my dog, and we'll run it through. Okay. This is John. So the RCMP arrives. 3 a.m. And from the point he was last seen at 
to the area they, he was walking towards the canine takes off doesn't find anything doesn't pick up on anything the fog limited visibility to 50 feet at 36 degrees in the middle of the night on November 7th the following morning 75 searchers arrived early in the morning now one of the first things the searchers find when I found this it blew my mind right away they find a decomposing body at the bottom of a cliff right near where John disappeared it was the body of a boy 17 year old boy named David Turnell who went missing six days earlier when he told his mom that he was going to go hiking up in the mountains and he vanished and that search was just over and they found nothing so in the same area they find David dead body at the bottom of the cliff hmm. they didn't say anything else about it very limited knowledge but about an hour and a half later at 8 a.m. searchers are 100 yards from where John disappeared and they're looking at the bottom of a cliff in an area that was searched intensively the day before and at the bottom of the 180 foot cliff 100 yards from where he was last seen previously searched by canines multiple times they find John's body twisted up at the bottom of the cliff he was found face down the coroner said he had a torn liver and kidney and here's one for you he wasn't wearing shoes he was when the parents last saw him but when they found him there were no shoes and they specifically stated that they searched the area intensively and never found the shoes now if those shoes were in the area I think the canines would have hit on them and found them shoes give off a really strong odor to canines so here's two people within a week that disappear in the same place both young boys found at the bottom of cliffs both dead in a cluster zone with what you now know if you've watched that movie this should have clicked on to you oh I was gonna give you a homework assignment I gotta give you one I want you to Google Vancouver BC UFOs do that on YouTube and I want you to see what comes up it'll blow your mind it'll it blew my mind the first time I saw it a couple years ago I do know that there are hundreds if not thousands of UFO sightings in that greater Vancouver area where this was it's one of the that southern British Columbia area is one of the most strange places on earth in my mind so the Isomans got their boy back but the translation on that word kind of stunned me I gotta say I feel sorry for him they lost a, a really good young boy So those are the three stories folks nobody has ever talked about these before actually there's three stories but there's six people involved very odd very odd if you could do me a favor and share this video I'd be humbled if you could make sure you're subscribed I can't tell you the number of people in the last month that have said they've been unsubscribed please make sure you're subscribed and uh, please follow me on Twitter David Politis at can am missing 
Uh, a lot of people sent in cases and I've already put them up on the Twitter. And I'm also on Truth Social, David Politis at Missing411. You can find me on both. Uh, I post there daily. Uh, you can follow what's going on in the area of missing people and other high strangeness that we talk about here. But put a comment down under the video. Give me a thumbs up if you like the video. Watch Missing 411, The UFO Connection on Amazon. Our first movie, Missing 411, on Amazon. Our second movie, Missing 411, The Hunted, on Amazon. Do not buy my books or videos, anything online at Amazon or any place else. Don't buy books on Amazon from me. I don't sell there. eBay and Amazon are ripping people off left and right, caught charging triple what we charge or quadruple what we charge for our books. You can find the books at our website, NA, like North America, BigfootSearch.com. NA, North America, like NA. Now here's the website, NA, BigfootSearch.com. That's the website. You can go there. And our missing person site, CanAmMissing.com. Thanks. Appreciate each one of you. One last homework assignment. Do a good deed for somebody out there this week. Whether you go shopping, walking down the block, do something for a neighbor, just do a good deed. It helps society. It helps our world. It, ha it will help somebody's mental health. Politis out. <laughs>